Hi. <clears throat> Hi. I'm a terrible thing. And today we're doing the third countdown uh, story uh, on the uh, the prequel stories for Six Days Sacrifice. This is The Mind. So let's get right into it. February 3rd, A.D. 2386. The double doors of the New Delhi Mental Hospital hiss closed as you step into the lobby. The weight of the mail satchel cuts into your shoulder, just as you did 20 separate times during the shuttle ride over here. You wonder how you got into this mess. The man in red assured you that there would be further instructions when you arrived, but hadn't elaborated before disappearing into the shadow alley where he was, had requested to meet you. You almost didn't take the job. You're not in the business of delivering parcels of homeless weirdos and tattered rags. But that all changed when the weirdo had produced a wad of cash as thick as your thumb. Had you not been so tired, you would probably have asked where the money had come from. There was something about the man in Red's voice. So smooth and charismatic. Impossible to resist. Kind of like what God's voice must be like. Not merely instructing or requesting, but simply stating how things were going to be. Like he knew everything. Forget it. Just another job. Get the instructions and deliver the parcel. Then enjoy the money and forget all about weirdos in red. Countdown 3. The Mind. Everything about the New Delhi Mental Hospital screams surgical. The uncarpeted floor is so sterilized you almost feel guilty walking on it. There are no corners in the architecture, no walls are cur- the walls are curved and smooth, painted in inspired pastel blue. The room stretches hugely in all directions, with exit doors to the south, and an archway labeled cell block one to the north. Okay, so I guess we're going north. You don't want to go anywhere near those freaks in the cells without a damn good reason. Okay. So, who do I have to give the parcel to? There's no address. The weirdo in the red in red just told you to bring it to the hospital and wait to be instructed on who to give it to. All right. Um South. Can't leave this place until you've delivered what you're supposed to deliver. All right, wait, maybe? Time passes. Oh, all right, look around, I guess. Everything about the mental, the New Delhi Mental Hospital Scream Surgical. Um, world, or, I don't know. Oh, okay. Outside the elevator. You're on the outside of the main elevator that can take you up to any of the 30 floors that make New Delhi Hospital, Mental Hospital, one of the better equipped loony bins in the United Coalition. Nearby is a small lounge area with a ratty looking sofa and a coffee table. On the coffee table is a page. You finally hear, oh, I'm sorry, you faintly hear the telephone ringing. Okay. Take page. taken. Read page. The Book of the Bridge, Chapter 3. 1. So the prince bade the bridgekeeper to touch the cunning thief, and at their conjoined, conjoined hands the covetous thief was thrown down, and truly did he know the name of the king. 2. The cunning thief wept aloud. Why have I been made part of this great evil? To have murdered with my hands, and to be made glad of mindless destruction through my own eyes. I curse this house. 3. The prince was rightly pleased. The cunning thief now sees our message, and will guide the bridgekeeper to the first of three constructions. Henceforth, the cunning thief shall be the guide. And the guide, who was the cunning thief, gathered together his thief wife and thief son, and in the house that was the mind of the bridgekeeper, they called to their host. 5. But the bridgekeeper was fearful, 
for the guide had clad the thief wife in vestments of the father and the thief son in those of the brother and the bridge keeper sobbed in his confusion six and the guide put fire to the bridge keeper and the body of the bridge keeper was destroyed utterly and the mind of the bridge keeper was destroyed by one half and across the great dark ocean one third of the bridge appeared seven and the king said i see the bridge but it is only one third it must be complete before i may attend the land of technology you faintly hear the phone ringing uh answer phone yeah i didn't think that would work um all right what else is around here you're outside of the main elevator Nearby is a small lounge area with a ratty-looking sofa and coffee table. Lobby. Reception. You are standing at reception, leaning over the desk with your elbows resting on the surface. Much of the wall before you is decorated with a suitably pacifying work of 2D art. Sitting askew at the reception desk is a white plastic telephone. The telephone is ringing. Answer your phone. There is no... What? Alright, take phone. You pick up the phone and hold it to your ear. A familiar voice says, The occupant of cell 105 is the recipient. Do not let the guards see you. You will receive more money as soon as the parcel is delivered. They hang up before you can say anything. And you replace the handset, baffled. 105, okay. All right, so I guess we go back to the east and then north corridor. You are now in an unfinished north-south corridor. There is a sign on one of the walls. Read the sign. It has two arrows, one pointing south marked lobby, and one pointing north says cell block one. All right, so go north. Cell 101. You're standing outside a hugely thick and armored door to a cell marked cell 101. The corridor continues east and south. There's a dropper built into the cell door. A learned-looking doctor type is here, flanked by a small entourage of youths. Toby, one of the guards, is patrolling here. The doctor seems to be giving a tour of the cell blocks to his apprentices and is giving a detailed description of occupant in cell 101. Listen to doctor. It would probably be best not to draw attention to yourself. We just can't seem to convince him that he isn't covered in, in, in crawling insects, says the doctor. We have to constantly keep his fingernails cut in case he scratches himself severely. And that's one of the least popular jobs among the orderlies, I can tell you. The youths titter fondly. All right. Time passes. The doctor and his entourage move east. So we're going to follow them. Cell 102. You're standing outside a hugely thick and armored door to the cell marked cell 102. More cells lie to the east and west. A learned looking doctor type is here, flanked by a small entourage of youths. Dropper in the cell door. I'm afraid most of the rest of the cases in cell block one are rather textbook. Certainly nothing worth washing your precious, wasting your precious time by giving a full description. The doctor pauses to push his spectacles back up his nose. There is one exception, however. I think you'll find this the highlights of the tour. I wonder if you guys know what's coming. Can guess what's coming. Okay, they move east. We follow them. Outside. Thick door. 103. Learned looking doctor type. Dropper. Doctor and his entourage move east. Okay, same thing. Doctor and his entourage move east. Good morning, Lionel, says the doctor courteously as he passes by the cell door without stopping. We continue east. Here we are, 105. This is our recipient. You are standing outside the hugely thick and armored door to cell marked cell 105, and this is the end of the cell block. The only way to go is back west. Learned looking doc doctor, uh, dropper, just like before. Clive, one of the guards, is patrolling here. This, of course, is our resident celebrity, says the doctor grandly, taking up position next to the peep pole. An attractive young female student peers at the cell's occupant 
and recognition lights up in her face. The Mephistopheles killer? You know who that is, right? Yes, you'll remember it was all over the news. Last year, the EMF... Uh, EFS Mephistopheles was relaunched with a skeleton crew of six. The appointed ship's counselor was one Dr. Jonathan Somerset, and he reported for duty punctually and on schedule. The youths draw near like children gathering around Nanny for story time. A slightly perverse smile flashes on the doctor's face. Unfortunately, shortly after the launch, it was discovered that the real Dr. Somerset was dead. Pushed down a flight of stairs, presumably by the imposter who had taken his place. Off-world security was dispatched to intercept the Mephistopheles. Its last recorded communication was an SOS distress call from the EFS Charisma to the EFS Charisma. By the time off-world security arrived, this man had slaughtered the entire crew. He glances at the sullen prisoner and shakes his head sadly. So who is he? asks a lanky, bespectacled youth. His name is Malcolm Somerset replies the doctor, the only son of Dr. Jonathan Somerset. He was a student of psychology at Gammamede University, wanting to follow in his father's footsteps. But he failed the final examination and dropped out. The doctor's eyes never leave the patient in cell 105 through his speech. There is a note of remorse in his voice. It seems becoming of a shipboard counselor was it seems becoming a shipboard counselor was his dream, and when his father was called up, he couldn't hold in his jealousy. The inter the inter interrogative interrogative yeah interrogative youth in spectacles poses the doctor another question. So why did he kill the Mephistopheles crew? That part, that's. Partly why he remains under psychiatric study, comes the answer. It's a complete mystery. His profile is completely inconsistent with a spree killer. The best theory we have is that he was found out and killed out of desperation. But that doesn't explain the demented creativity, the sheer bloodthirsty relith, re relish, relish with which his crewmates were slaughtered. The doctor's expression is suddenly very dark. One man was impaled. Another was blinded. The first officer had her head twisted right around, and many of the corpses were dismembered and stitched randomly together into Frankenstein-like monstrosities. He takes an, a moment to watch the horrified faces of the students and let them gawk through the peephole some more, trying to imagine how the silent creature before them could have committed such things. Certainly not the actions of a man simply trying to cover up a, few, a far lesser serious crime. But let's leave him for the moment and move on, says the doctor. And he and the students move westward with obvious haste. Okay, so, we're alone here now, except for that guard, I believe. Let's look. Yeah, Clive, one of the guards, is patrolling here. So, I think we can just wait Clive out. Maybe not. Oh, <sighs> um... Put parcel in dropper. The guard eyes you suspiciously as you reach for the parcel. You quickly decide not to deliver it just yet. And Clive leaves head westward on patrol. Okay, so now he leaves. Put parcel in dropper. There we go. The guard eyes you suspiciously. Oh no. Okay, you place the parcel in the dropper while no one is looking and slam it shut. Feeling an enormous sense of accomplishment and relief, you exit the cell block and swiftly leave the asylum by the front door. After collecting your fee, you live out the rest of your life in varying degrees of happiness and contentment. Occasionally, the strange man in red and the contents of the mysterious parcel will come back to haunt your curiosity. But this is nothing that can't be swiftly dismissed. You will never know the significance of the role you played in the machinations of destiny.
So, we'll come back around to Malcolm Somerset. We now know what happened to him. He is in an insane asylum. Um, and the question still lingers, why did he kill his father to go into space? Was that the only reason? He's kind of an interesting character. And uh, we're going to find out that the answer to that and many other questions in the next game, uh, Six Days of Sacrifice. So, uh, until next time, just remember... Oh, I'm sorry. If uh, I should say, <laughs> please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this content. But um, until next time, remember, a mind is a terrible thing. Goodbye.